period. Which is she's still cunning. I'm thinking of. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. I'm unmuted. Okay. We're just waiting for Renew too mm -hmm. to start. Thanks. Mm We need African elites in India. It's the yellow, you know, the orange book. Yes, I know the book. It's my book. No, no, it's one in the bottom. Of course. I guess we're, we're still since I did promise most people a bibliography last time can I just use this time to uh, put in chat for everybody a uh, bibliography yeah sure it's cursory but at least it'll get things started. So if anybody's looking for articles and the few books, uh, this should be it.
I think we can start now. Yes. Okay. So Renew. good evening. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the last and the last of the third day, three day series, the Kingdom of Ahmednagar. Today's session is Architectural History of Ahmednagar by Puskar Shoni, and the session will be chaired by Dr. Kenneth Robbins. Dr. Kenneth Robbins is a scholar and archivist collector. He has curated many exhibits and scholarly conferences dealing with Maharajas and Nawabs in Indian history. Paintings, photographs, art, religion, medicine, numismatics, and philately, as well as multiple exhibits on Jews in India. His book, African Elites in India, was the basis for a New York Public Libraries Conference Center for Black Culture Exhibition, which traveled to dozens of destinations on five continents, including the UN and UNESCO. He has published more than 130 articles and co-edited and co-authored 14 books, including African Rulers and Generals in India and African Elites in India. His work on the Deccan also focuses on Kolhapur and the Deccan States Agency, as well as the Bene Israel and the Nawabs of Chanjira. Our speaker for the evening, Pushkar Soni, to whom you need no introduction, and yet I'll share a brief bio, is the Chair Humanities and Social Sciences at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Pune. The author of Architecture of a Deccan Sultanate, Courtly Practice and Royal Authority in, led, uh, in Late Medieval India. He received his PhD in the history of art from the University of Pennsylvania with a dissertation focused on the architecture of the Nizam Shahs of Ahmednagar. A licensed architect in India, he trained in historic preservation has extensively published on the history built environment. Over to you, Dr. Kenneth Robbins. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been a great honor for us to be here uh, and with the Asiatic Society and the Mumbai Research Center. Um, Pushkar, I'm going to turn this right over to you. I'd hope to talk a little bit about the paintings, but you covered everything uh, in passing in uh, in your lecture on history. But, but go, go ahead. I mean, feel free to. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I think that you. I think you covered it masterfully, and I think you're going to do the same thing here. But I'm hoping that we're going to open up discussion as the architecture of uh, questions about. Uh, not only royal architecture and city architecture, but also about uh, architecture of dargars and other things, and maybe something about is there any Hindu architecture uh, that needs to be uh, discussed. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here patiently on the third day of what uh, has been a very nice series. I couldn't make it yesterday because I was giving a talk at Somaya College, uh, which is where I'm still sitting today as I uh, talk to you about the architecture of the Nizam Shahs. Uh, let me start the slides by showing you something uh, that, ha that has been happening in Ahmednagar. But before that, let me... Uh, yeah. About three years ago, um, a mosque that I used to pass on the way to Salabat Khan's tomb quite regularly uh, collapsed in the rains. And uh, the mosque, luckily for us, had a very nice inscription on the inside, uh, but the monument is completely gone. And it says whoever builds a mosque, even if it is no bigger than a place where birds perch, God builds for him a house in paradise. And uh, I think as we are letting a lot of these monuments go, uh, we probably might find ourselves places elsewhere uh, because the monuments in Ahmednagar are disappearing at an alarming rate. And by monuments, I do not mean just royal commissions, but also buildings uh, that were built by ordinary people, by merchants, public buildings, a lot of whom do not have claim and the fabric, like a lot of Indian cities, is disappearing rather fast. In any case, uh, we will have a bit of repetition from last time, because this is the history of the Kingdom of Ahmednagar. We'll be looking at it through the lens of architecture. Now, the city of Ahmednagar is one of the very few cities in India that can be precisely dated to its foundation year. We know the year 1494 in which it was founded by Ahmed Nizam Shah. 
and it served as their capital for a period of over 100 years till 1600 when it was captured by the Mughals. It was in this period of 106 years that it became one of the largest urban settlements in the Deccan, along with the other cities of Bidar, Dawlatabad, Golconda, and Gulbarga. It was politically and economically a very important city through the 16th century. And though it is recovered from the Mughals by the Nizam Shahs under Malik Ambar, uh, it never quite regained its past glory after 1600, as the capital of the Kingdom of Ahmadnagar also had been shifted to Daulatabad and then later to the settlement of Kharki, which we now today know as Aurangabad. Uh, the Mughal city of Aurangabad, then known as Khujista Bunyad, grew in importance and became the capital of the Deccan Suba through the 17th century. The Nizam Shahs were completely subjugated by the Mughals in 1636, and it was the independent kingdom of the Marathas under Chhatrapati Shivaji which emerged in the western regions of the Nizam Shahi kingdom of Ahmadnagar. The Marathas were based in their hill fort strongholds, such as Raigad and Rajgad, and then the cities of western Maharashtra, such as Pune, Satara, uh, well, Satara also comes a little later, uh, and Kolhapur. So the indigenous struggle of the Marathas of the Deccan against the invading Mughals of North India has captured popular imagination and has been valorized in the nationalist movement after the mid 19th century. So the you know, popularization of Maratha history including included the likes of Justice M.G. Ranade, uh, the historian V.K. Rajwade, and of course, Bal Gangadhar Tilak. For them, the emergence of the Marathas against the Mughals represented a strong indigenous resistance to colonial power, a motif that had political resonance with circumstances in their own period. Already after 1818, when the Peshwa's armies had surrendered to the British in the Maratha cities of Western Maharashtra had become cultural centers under the Bombay presidency. Ahmednagar was nominally on this list, but it had not been an important center of the Marathas. The centers of the Marathas through the 18th century had been Nasik, Pune, Satara, and Kolhapur. And therefore the city of Ahmednagar in the 19th century was really only known for a British garrison and a fort. Ahmadnagar had ceased to have any kind of ceremonial, political, or social relevance till the 20th century, when again a new chapter of history opens up. And in 1942, a number of nationalist leaders were imprisoned in the fort of Ahmadnagar. And even today, unfortunately, the city of Ahmadnagar and the fort of Ahmadnagar are sparsely visited, uh, something that I hope all of you after this lecture will uh, endeavor to change. But the city and its surrounding areas contain several architectural sites from the period of the Nizam Shahs, representing building programs of the period. The legacy of the Nizam Shahs of Ahmadnagar is always overshadowed by other sultanates in the Deccan. And the independent kingdom of the Marathas that was created in the same geographical and physical, I mean, political space. So the city was a locus of the architecture and cultural contributions of the dynasty and is a very significant piece in understanding the political culture of the Sultanate Deccan. The different architectural programs patronized by the Nizam Shahs reveal very different facets of the period. And Ahmadnagar is one of the very few places in Maharashtra, uh, the foundation of which is known uh, and it also has a layer of history that you don't commonly find in too many other places. And so we talked uh, of the 15th and 16th centuries when a steady flow of people from West Asia uh, came to the Deccan. And when the Bahmani Sultanate unraveled, the successor Sultanates shared a commensurate Persianate culture and were constantly feuding, conducting marital alliances. We looked at some of them last time. They were insulting each other's envoys and there are lots of stories about the insults that get traded between the different kingdoms in the Deccan. And this is all possible because they have a shared world and a shared worldview that comprise the Deccan and parts of Iran. Eventually in the 17th century, as the Mughals swept across South Asia, architecture and planning, sorry, I think uh, I don't have that here, but, but as the Mughals sweep through, as you see in the picture on the right, architecture and planning, 
in the Deccan are replaced by a hegemonic Mughal form. Uh, this, you know, the Nizam Shahi dynasty is the most short-lived of the three big dynasties in the Deccan, Bijapur, Golconda, and Ahmednagar. Uh, we also talked about Malik Nizamul Mulk, the patriarch or the founder of the Nizam Shahs, who was an important person at the Bahmani court. Uh, uh, and his son basically was a decorated soldier who controlled a large part of the Western Deccan, particularly the hill forts. And he's the one who decides against all foreigners to decide uh, uh, to establish a local dynasty, a dynasty that will be known eventually as the Nizam Shahs. And the first battle they have against the Bahmanis is at this place called the Bagh Nizam, which is where the fort of Ahmadnagar is constructed. We looked at the fort last time and talked about why it was constructed at this location, which though it does not have a lot of water, uh, the Nizam Shahs do have technologies to bring water from far away. And this is a very important base from which they can keep attacking the fort of Daulatabad, which eventually within four or five years, they will conquer. The tomb of Hazrat Bagh Nizam marks the Barbican, which we just saw in the previous slide. We also talked of the foundation of the city, which is described in various texts like the tarikh e Firishta and the burhan e Masir. And both of them talk of how great a city was built. And the city, as you see, is on the left here. The walls are built by Aurangzeb. It's under the Mughals that the walls are built. It was not a walled city when it was built. What was walled instead was this place called the Fort of Ahmadnagar, very discreet from the city. And another walled enclosure that you have here is called the Bara Imam Kotla. And we'll talk about it in some detail later today. The other cities in the Deccan that we talked of, like Daulatabad, which you see on the top left, Bidar, uh, the center uh, on the top. On the right-hand side, you see Golconda. Uh, at the bottom, you see Ahmedabad, which is about 100 years earlier. Uh, and then Bijapur at the bottom left. All these cities have a citadel that is either adjacent, abutting, or within the walled city. Ahmednagar truly is different because the city is not walled and the fort is at a short distance. And there are many reasons for this, which we won't touch upon today, but it has to do with changing ideas of what constitutes defense against gunpowder. Now, the first king, Ahmad Nizam Shah, has only one building in Ahmadnagar that can be definitively attributed to him, and it's his own mausoleum. The tomb that he has designed for himself, most likely in his lifetime, and where he remains buried. I am sure that he hoped this would be an important uh, uh, necropolis, and his successors would be buried in the grounds around, but that was never to be because they converted to Shiism and instead had their bodies transported to Karbala. He was succeeded by his son, Buran Nizam Shah I. So this is Ahmad Nizam Shah. Buran Nizam Shah was a great patron of the arts. He also has the fortune of ruling for a very long time. And in days when life expectancy was not even 50, having somebody rule for about 40 years is a significantly long rule. It's like Akbar who rules for a very long time in the latter half of the 16th century. Buran Nizam Shah the <clears> first <throat> rules for a very long time. And he came under the influence of a Shia teacher, Shah Tahir Husseini, in the 1530s and changed the state religion to Shia Islam, in particular Twelver Islam, Ithna Asari. Shah Tahir founded the academy of Bara Imam Kotla, and what you see at the bottom right is that big enclosure, the only walled structure around the city of Ahmadnagar, apart from the fort, which was basically an academy, a university of sorts, if you think of it that way. This academy, the Bara Imam Kotla, caused a steady stream of scholars and men of letters from the Middle East to come to Ahmadnagar. Uh, there were embassies in this time that were exchanged with the Safavid kings of Iran. We know this because those letters have been read. 
and Duran Nizam Shah's generous patronage of migrants became very liberal over time. And coupled with Shah Tahir's fame and the renown of this academy, there are several soldier adventurers and men of letters who come to Ahmednagar to make their fortune. In fact, we know of at least two or three manuscripts, important ones, that are in various libraries around the world that are produced in Ahmednagar at this time. What does this academy look like? Where well, it's a very large walled square enclosure and on the sides you have rooms like a dormitory. This is an architectural type, a big square enclosure with rooms along all the walls like you see here that is used for caravanserais. It is used for various kinds of academies. It is sometimes used for a mosque. Uh, it is an architectural form that is used for a number of architectural programs. But again, with Burhan Nizam Shah, we do not know a lot except for the Bara Imam Kotla that he builds. And within the Bara Imam Kotla, there is a mosque called the Soneri Mosque, uh, which probably is one of the two largest mosques in the kingdom of Ahmednagar that they build or which is built after them. The larger mosques that you have are in the fort of Daulatabad, the Jami Masjid, now called the Bharat Mata Mandir. But that is acquired by the Nizam Shahs from previous regimes. It's not a mosque they build. This mosque, the Kotla Mosque, is a mosque that uh, is built under the reign of Buran Nizam Shah. And in terms of dimensions, it's not very big if you think about it. It's only five bays wide and three bays deep. But that's the largest mosque you'll find in the city of Ahmednagar. And we'll talk of reasons about that too. Now, Burhan Nizam Shah is succeeded by his son, who is also a patron of the arts, doesn't live terribly long, but rules for about, uh, you know, 13, 14 years. This is Hussein Nizam Shah the first, made infamous because of his role in the Battle of Talikota, where he brings a large force of artillery against Ram Raya of Vijayanagar, and it is under his uh, uh, leadership that all the other sultanates band together. And this happens because of particularly insulting treatment that he's received at the hands of Ram Raya just a few months before the battle. In any case, Hussein Nizam Shah uh, ascends the throne. His is the reign where we start, start seeing the first paintings. And he also finds new prosperity in the aftermath of the Battle of Talikota. And we know that a number of things are built in his reign, including the, uh, the you know, building of in stone of the fort of Ahmednagar, which is done in his reign. And we know this by an inscription. I'll just show you the inscription in a minute. But it's also in his reign that the Damri Masjid, an exquisite small little mosque just outside the city is built. And you start seeing what will become, uh, you know, a characteristic style of the Nizam Shahs. So this mosque, if you notice, does not have a dome on top. It has a flat roof. But to make up for that visually, they have what is called a flying arch, an arch through which you can put your hand through, uh, which reminds you of a dome that might have been there. But of course, it doesn't exist. This is the inscription which was published. Uh, uh, you know, four or five years ago by me and William Wiatkowski, uh, which talks of how in the 1550s, uh, Hussein Nizam Shah, probably upon ascending the throne, immediately decides to rebuild the fort completely in stone. And this too is, uh, you know, a strategy against uh, fast changing gunpowder technologies. There are other buildings that also get built. We look at some of them like uh, uh, Sarjay Khan's tomb, popularly known as the Doboti Chira. The next ruler called the mad ruler, Murtaza Divana, Murtaza Nizam Shah, the first who rules from, well, he comes to throne at, in 1565. Khunzada Humayun, his mother, really runs the kingdom for him. He rebels, finally puts her in prison and takes over. And he rules for a period of about 20 years. And it's a rule that up and down, uh, you have the largest buildings commissioned in his reign. You seem to have enormous amounts of painting done in his reign. There seems to be a general prosperity, 
The kingdom is expanding. It is in this period that the kingdom annexes another sultanate that we know of, the sultanate of uh, the Imad Shahs. And it's also in his reign that you have the first skirmishes with the Mughals, who under their various princes, Daniel, Murad, and so on, are making incursions into the Nizam Shahi kingdom from the north. Murtaza Nizam Shah uh, has a reign that is also marred by several massacres of Afakis, this faction at court made up of ethnic Iranians. And many of the court nobility originally were from uh, greater Iran, and many of them leave during his reign and immediately after his reign. But we, there is a silver lining to all this because you also see the rise of several important Habshi or uh, you know, Siddhi uh, adventurers and generals in this period. You also see the rise of uh, local Deccanese and also Maratha nobles who all get military and political prominence under his reign. So the kingdom of Ahmednagar expands enormously in his reign, but also becomes increasingly factional and uh, basically fragmented. And it's no different from the kind of Pyrrhic wars you'll see under Aurangzeb uh, a century later, where as Aurangzeb's kingdom keeps expanding, it actually is uh, uh, really getting uh, rickety at its center. Now, after Murtaza Nizam Shah, there is a succession of kings some of whom are killed, some of whom are deposed. And then you have somebody who rules the last uh, stable independent king of the Nizam Shahs, somebody who issues the first gold coins of the dynasty, Burhan Nizam Shah II, already quite an aged man when he comes to rule. And we have some buildings attributed to him, notably the Kamani Masjid on the fort of Shivneri. Here undergoing restoration, but high up on the right minar, there is an inscription that tells you uh, that the mosque was actually built in his reign. He also commissioned works of uh, you know, civic importance such as direction stones, religious importance like mosques and military importance. There are some fortifications built by him. But today we look at three building programs that are extensively patronized under the Nizam Shahs uh, under various kings and the remains of which are adequately extant. So there are other kinds of things that they built. Uh, there are articles in Epigraphia Indo-Muslimica in the 1970s of uh, direction stones of the Nizam Shahs. These are all uh, transcribed and translated by uh, Mr. Kadri, an epigraphist with the archaeological survey. But these smaller things we want to look at, we'll look at three broad architectural programs. The first one of which is palaces, which are always exciting. The second one of which are going to be uh, mosques, and the third are going to be uh, tombs. And so let's start with palaces, because they remind you most of a legacy that the Nizam Shahs would like to claim, though they claim to be a local family from Maratwada, they also had aspirations to keep up in terms of fashion and in terms of their kingship with dynasties all over the world. And certainly the Timurid model was well known. If nobody had visited it, stories about it still circulated. And the whole idea was to have a capital city where you got artisans from everywhere to build for you. But you yourself resided most of the time in leisure resorts outside the town, farmhouses of a kind, if you may. And so we look at four palace sites of the Nizam Shahs, which are all in the vicinity of the city of Ahmadnagar. In fact, uh, two of them have now come within the city of Ahmadnagar. They are no longer in the vicinity of. And uh, all four of them have slightly different uh, purposes. And they are used for, uh, 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 they were used for uh, uh, completely different functions. And we'll look at those two. And so while the fort of the destroyed palace served as their primary residence, they did spend a lot of time in these palaces. In fact, in the bottom left palace called the Hasht Behisht Bagh, we know that Murtaza, this Murtaza Divana, spent 12 years of his life uh, trying to disengage himself from any kind of statecraft. So here are the four palaces. Top left, you have Farah Baksh Bagh. On the right hand side, on top, you have a place called Manzar Sumba. On the bottom left, you have Hasht Behisht Bagh. And on the bottom right, you have Kailavantinitsa Mahal. 
two types of secular structures survive in great numbers, one of which is palaces and the other are hammams. And some of these hammams are also attached to these palaces. All these buildings are built in stone and timber. And this is very reminiscent. This is so unlike Mughal building, which is built in brick and clad with stone or built in brick and plastered over in stucco plaster. These buildings actually have timber framing and the walls are filler walls built out of solid masonry. And then the whole thing is plastered over. You also have a lot of cut and molded stucco for decoration and we'll look at examples of that. And mansions that were built for the elite, and we have very few of them, can be distinguished from these royal palaces uh, through their physical context and there are also historical references. So three of these palaces find mention, for example, in Aurangzeb's memoirs and also the memoirs of somebody called Bhimsen Saxena, who used to be an office bearer of Aurangzeb. The, the mansions of the nobles are in the city wards and we looked at them yesterday like Nemat Khan's uh, palace, which is now a municipal building. So the first building, Farah Baksh Bagh, is an enormous garden and it really is enormous with a central pavilion and the pavilion is on a raised platform and the road that you see leading up to the palace did not exist. You had to cross over in a boat uh, over water. So this was also physically isolated. You got in, there is a massive lake, an artificial lake that is created with regular walled embankments on the outside. And it is flooded with water and you cross over and you are in this little paradisical uh, oasis. Nehmat Khan Semnani, the same Nehmat Khan whose estate we looked at, was originally commissioned by Murtaza Nizam Shah in 15, uh, you know, uh, in the 1570s to build this palace. And we know that he built the palace and there is a reference that somebody poisoned the king's ears saying the palace is very triangular. And so he had it rebuilt. And I don't think he actually had the palace demolished and rebuilt. But by triangular, there probably were pyramidal vaults on top of the building. Because the only way you'd perceive a palace as being triangular is looking at those roofs on top. And those roofs probably were taken down. The building itself is cross-axially symmetrical, which means along two axes, uh, there are very few changes. It's, uh, you know, you can design one fourth of the building and you have a plan for all of it, except for one room over here, which is a small room that none of the other corners have. The construction technology, is local. I mean, you're using so much wood, but the design is certainly of Timurid uh, inspiration. This plan type is the what is called the Hasht Behisht plan, the eight paradises plan, where you have in the center a big chamber that is either open or domed, but around it you have a succession of eight spaces. No palatial building of this scale survives in Timurid heartlands or in Iran. And this is what a section of it looks like. Mm -hmm. And this very odd roof and ceiling that you have over here is suggestive of the fact that once upon a time, there were probably pyramidal wards, which upon the king's women fancy were pulled down. And so an inscription now, which is in the district court, uh, provides a chronogram for the date of this building, which is 17, uh, sorry, 1583. 84. This is what the building looks like. It's undergone massive uh, repairs recently, but it still has a lot of the original wood. And you can see it, the construction is like a lot of wadas, which are built by the Marathas. You build a wooden framework and then you build masonry around it. The advantage of this technique is that you know exactly where to build the masonry. And this wood really you'll find at every floor everywhere. You'll see it on top, you'll see it in the middle, you'll see it at the bottom. And where you have these empty niches, wood has been stripped uh, by people. The ceilings are wonderfully decorated in stucco patterns. And these patterns can be traced back again uh, to uh, both Bahmani designs, but also to des designs in West Asia. And in terms of scale, the Farah Baksh Bagh is in the middle. On the left, you have Humayun's tomb. 
and on the right you have the Taj Mahal and you can see that all of them belong to the same family of buildings, this plan type that we know emerges out of Central Asia. The next palace we'll look at is really uh, something special, the Hasht Behisht Bagh. It's a, it's a very large campus and only small parts of it survive. And the photos I'll show were taken a while ago. Now it's completely surrounded by new construction. What you have again is a very large pool of water, octagonal this time, in the middle of which is a pavilion where you have to retire by boat. And we'll look at the pavilion. There is a gateway to this complex on the left-hand side. The label Lakad Mahal is wrong here. Uh, this is the gateway. And then attached to this gateway is a set of rooms that comprise a hammam. So this is the pavilion in the middle of this octagonal pool. In front of every arch is basically an outlet for a pipe. So there would have been fountains in front of each one of these arch openings. The building is two-storied. Again, once you are there, nobody can disturb you. This is the gateway we are talking of. And attached to the gateway on the left-hand side is a hammam. This most likely is the place where Murtaza Nizam Shah I retired to for a period of 12 years. And therefore, the hammam was added on to this gateway. Therefore, not only does it disturb the symmetry of the gateway, but you look at the construction, it is built abutting the gateway, which means it was built later. This is the hammam. And what is characteristic of hammams are these roofs with openings called nurgirs. Nurgir literally means light catcher. And that's exactly what these skylights are. Uh, Mr. Yogesh Abhyankar has a question, what kind of wood? And again, I haven't done studies on the wood to know what kind it is, but it has to be a big tree because the beams are enormous. In any case, these nurgirs are used on hammams. So when you see a building with flattish domes that are perforated with holes, with these kinds of skylights, chances are that there is a hammam in that place. There is a similar hammam in the fort of Shivneri. Again, in extremely dilapidated condition, um, the ceiling is falling. Every year we see a little more of the fabric lost. Uh, the, now that uh, you know it's built up all around, I don't know how long these buildings will survive. Um, one only hopes that uh, the decline is not as visible as the mosque we saw right at the beginning. In the same campus, about a few hundred meters from the gatehouse, to the Hasht Behisht Bagh is this building, which is an underground gallery, an underground palace, if you may, with what is called a badgir on top. A badgir now means a wind catcher, just like Nurgir nur meant light catcher. This is a wind catcher. And the idea is that in very hot summers, you go and stay in the subterranean chambers, which are cooled by wind that is caught by this uh, tall tower-like structure. And this is a technology we know emerges in Iran. You find it in Southern Iran, in places like uh, 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 Kesh, you find it in Bandar Abbas, you find it actually even in Kirman, you'll find it in Sistan. And this technology is to be seen in many buildings in Iran, but built in brick, almost never in stone. And even inside where you see those windows on top, there are baffled walls which will channel the wind a certain way to go and pull the chambers beneath. There have been encroachments, they have, they have been cleared, uh, but now that the area is built up, the whole thing acts as a natural drain. And uh, though there have been valiant attempts by people like Mr. Vinit uh, Sate to clean it, uh, uh, really with every rain, it fills up again. Again, on the same campus of the Hasht Behisht Bagh is this building called Bites Neighbors. Uh, again, a fine example of a Timurid style palace that is built by the Nizam Shahs with these big openings called Ivans, these big portals. These are designs that are coming in from West Asia. 
but they are being executed locally by people who have expertise in building in stone. And so what you will see being built in brick in Isfahan, you'll see being built in stone in India. The third palace that we talk of is this place, Manzar Sumba, which is, which is right at the edge of the Ahmadnagar Plateau. And if you look at the photograph at the bottom, the plateau, the Ahmadnagar Plateau is on the left. And on the right, you have a sharp drop. And what you have are the plains of Marathwada towards Aurangabad, towards Kuldabad, towards Daulatabad. And therefore, very fittingly, on the edge of this plateau, overlooking a distance of 40 kilometers towards Daulatabad, is this site called Manzar Sumba, or originally called Manzar Suba. Because once you are up there, what you see, uh, that is the hilltop site, are planes that take you all the way to the important sites of Daulatabad and uh, Khuldabad. Halfway down this hill is a set of caves, probably pre-existing uh, the Nizam Shahi construction, which store water. They are water cisterns like you find at a lot of Buddhist sites all across the Western Ghats. But the Nizam Shahs have constructed a very clever water lifting tower that will lift water up to the hilltop and fill up an enormous pool. And this is what you see. Uh, you have uh, this water lifting tower. You have a set of pipelines. And then you have a place from where water is channeled into various places, including a very large pool. And there is also half subterranean, a hammam at one end. So if you live in this palace, you can still live cleanly. This mosque, which is inserted in here, might be slightly later, perhaps when Aurangzeb takes over this area, because it looks very out of place and is very uncharacteristic. The gatehouse to this hilltop itself is a spectacular piece of work. Now, again, look at all these windows and the way they are arranged in groups of three and also in two stories. There is a window at the bottom and a window at top. These kinds of compositions of elevation are very characteristic of the Nizam Shahs. In fact, if you look at even the Hash Behisht Bagh, uh, the gatehouse to it, you will see windows in similar patterns. The gatehouse is stunningly beautiful. It again doesn't have a dome on top, but the ceiling from inside is a vaulted ceiling. And here too, what appears to be brick is actually small stones dressed in the size of bricks. Because no doubt, while the foremen and the designers are coming from the traditions, the local craftsmen that you hire are going to be people very well versed in crafting stone. And so you have this beautiful merger of West Asian design and Deccani construction happening uh, to great effect. Once it is plastered over, of course, you can't tell whether, luckily for us, these buildings are falling apart so badly that you can really see how they were put together. So these are more views of the same site. On the top left, you have this hammam, which is partially underground. You have the mosque, which is a strange insertion over here. This is the water lifting tower. And at the bottom left, you have these, the plains towards Daulatabad. This is the palace. More of it falls every time I visit it, not because I visit it, but um, because it's weathering very quickly. And this is the gatehouse from where you see this palace. So you first come to the gatehouse, you see the palace, you go there, you discover there is a hammam there. And then on one side, there is the big water tower that will raise water to fill up the pool. The construction technology of this palace is exactly the same as that of uh, Hasht Bihisht Bagh. And so because a lot of it was falling, uh, you could really see how it was put together. And I had made some drawings 15, 20 years ago of uh, the construction details. And this kind of construction is also quite unique. You almost never see it anywhere else. These very thick flat slabs, uh, in fact, uh, thick to the point of redundancy, uh, also supported by small uh, uh, terracotta features and wood. And this is how they're falling. I mean, uh, um, again, I don't think they will survive uh, for very long. 
but all this wood is period important for us. The fourth site is a site called Kalavantinita Mahal, which is on the road to Bid. And it's just across the border from Ahmednagar district into Bid. And uh, again, nobody seems to know much about it. I wrote an article some years ago suggesting that this was actually uh, very important in the Battle of Bhatavdi, a battle in which Malikambar and Shahji defeat a joint force of the Mughals and the Adil Shahs of Bijapur. Because there is always mention of the fort of Bhatavdi, which we've really never seen. There is a small gadi close by in Vargao Daulat, but there is no fort. And this is the closest that comes to a fortified enclosure. And Bhatavdi is not very far from here. Uh, in fact, there is an Izam Shai period dam uh, repaired by the British in Bhatavdi. This is what the large palace looks like. You have enormous enclosure walls, which are now gone, but you can trace them on the ground. And then you have a big arena, an open space with four pavilions around it. And the northernmost pavilion is also behind another wall. And it has very good access to the roof. And north of this pavilion are a set of uh, really uh, pools that suggest that there would have been some kind of garden over here. Also in the area, you find lots of stones with holes in them. These are stones of a kind that are used to tether animals. And so large numbers of animals were probably brought here at some point, And the size of these stones would suggest elephants. These are the four pavilions that you have on four sides. And again, they are enormous. They don't survive very well, except the northern pavilion, which you see over here. And here too, you will start seeing the same compositions of window over door or window over window, three windows in a line and so on. This pavilion is the best preserved of all of them and the most decorative as well. And like I said, north of the pavilion is uh, again a big uh, veranda, almost like uh, a loggia, beyond which you have pools and gardens. And so no doubt this was meant for the royal family. And so what you have is in this plan, you will have over here, a big enclosure in which you have military parades, you have military displays, perhaps you have elephant fights, you have various kinds of pavilions on all sides, but you have the royal pavilion which is set off by a wall and beyond that are gardens. And most palaces where the king would sit facing outside face north in this period because light from the north doesn't have the glare that light from the south does. East and West are out of the question because the sunlight comes at a direct angle. In any case, all four palaces serve slightly different functions and that is of importance to us. And so the variety in scale and design, these palaces share a few traits. We've talked about those, but they have major differences in the way that they are used. Parabaksh Bagh was the setting for entertaining diplomatic guests and the grand scale of a building set in a huge pool of water was clearly meant to impress. And we know this because there are descriptions of the kind of uh, uh, diplomatic parties that happen. There are poets gatherings. There are poems written about the Parabaksh Bagh in the Parabaksh Bagh, uh, which we also know of. And so it is a remarkable place where uh, the idea is to impress, the idea is to support uh, literary gatherings and so on. Hash Behisht Bagh was a palace complex built for a more personal, intimate scale. And therefore, it's no surprise that Murtaza Nizam Shah chooses to retire here for a long time. Manzar Somba, while a pleasure palace, is also a military outpost. One has to realize the strategic importance of this place. Uh, you enjoy the king enjoys the views of the plains towards Dawlatabad, thus symbolically commanding and appropriating the whole area under his domain. And then at the bottom right, you have basically an arena for military review, sporting activity, and so on. 
And so reminiscent of Timurid Herat, you have uh, the king having with, with a, a fortified palace in the close to the city. And then all around at short distances, you have these great fortified palaces. Now, the second kind of program we'll talk about is the architectural program of the mosque and why it is important and how it's really unique in case of the Nizam Shahs. And it really begins like this. This is a slightly better map than the yellow lines yesterday. This is a map of the old city of Ahmednagar uh, after it's walled by the Mughals, of course. But, you know, everybody has looked at the monumental and dynastic architecture, but uh, the spatial distribution of mosques in the city, or in fact, through the kingdom of Ahmednagar is of special interest to us here as you can construct a whole social landscape from this. Now, since Ahmednagar was a completely new city founded by Ahmad Nizam Shah, uh, decisions regarding its layout, planning and construction were all deliberate. They have not acquired some city. The city had to be profitable economically, but also symbolically connected to models of urban development that the Nizam Shahs aspired to. And so the development of different parts of the city was given to different court nobles and officials. And we saw that yesterday. We saw a plan in which different wards of the city have different names. One is called Shahjipura, one is called Nemat Khani, one is called something, you know, Farad Khani. And in all these wards, there will be mosques that are built by the nobleman who is in charge of that ward. So even if parts of the city were parceled out to various court nobles, because the, of its status as a capital city named after the dynastic founder, it is very unlikely that the settlement was beyond the purview of royal control. There must have been some royal oversight. In any case, the fort of Ahmednagar, the royal residence is also about a mile away, a couple of kilometers, uh, very close to uh, the city. And so there would have been some oversight over the city. But it's important that of all the sultans of Ahmednagar, only one is known to have spent one night in the city. Otherwise, there is no reference to them being in the city. Now, except for inherited mosques, apart from uh, well, things like the Jami Mosque in Daulatabad, the kingdom of Ahmednagar never builds big mosques. And all the mosques that you see in the city and in the kingdom are tiny. So the largest mosques built under the Nizam Shahs are five bays wide and three bays deep. We've seen one of them already, the mosque on the right hand side. The mosque on the left is at Shaul, most probably built under the Nizam Shahs, but otherwise maybe built in a small period of time by the Bijapur Sultans in the same place. But these are the biggest mosques in the kingdom of Ahmednagar, not big at all. Yet all the political actions of the king always seem to rely on the Friday sermon, which is mentioned in several historical accounts of the kingdom, where in the, in the khutbah, the king made a declaration and so on. The actual mechanism by which the khutbah is disseminated is unknown, but it's clear that there is no Jami mosque where it can be performed. The architectural program, or indeed the institution of a large royal or congregational mosque, a Jami mosque, is absent from the kingdom of Ahmednagar. The small mosques are in this slide that you saw yesterday in these neighborhood wards. So Nemat Khan will build in the Nemat Khani ward a small mosque. And those are the kinds of mosques you see throughout the city. Sometimes only three bays wide and one bay deep. Uh, sometimes double those proportions, but not much bigger. And so uh, this is really puzzling what happens with the mosque. Each mosque carries either the name of a court official, so Qasim Khan, uh, you know, uh, Nemat Khan and so on. Sometimes they have occupational groups. Uh, sometimes they have names that give physical characteristics like Kali Masjid, Kamani Masjid. Uh, and sometimes they talk of construction history. Damri Mosque is supposed to be built by the small coin called Dham that laborers contributed. Um, towards the building of this mosque. 
but not a single mosque in the city carries any royal label. Nothing is called the Ahmad um, Shah Mosque. Nothing is called the Burhan Nizam Shah Mosque. Nothing is called the Nizam Shah Mosque. There is no suggestion that any of these mosques were commissioned, patronized, or indeed used by the Nizam Shahs. Now we know, uh, this is the Dambi Masjid, that the Nizam Shahs were staunch 12 Shias since the conversion of Burhan Nizam Shah under Shah Tahir Husseini. Shah Tahir implemented a radical program of promoting 12 Shiism. So, uh, including the foundation of the academy, the Bara Imam Kotla. And through most of the 16th century, the Safavid state in Iran, which professed 12 Shiism, did not accommodate the function of Friday prayers. So, because of popular beliefs and a series of theological interpretations, a complete embrace of Friday prayers at a Jami Masjid as a projection of state power was not embraced by the Safavids. There is an important cleric called Al Karaki who had issued several fatwas that denounced large congregational mosques. And funnily, there is a manuscript of one of Al Karaki's texts which is produced in Ahmadnagar. So we know that he is known. Uh, there are legal anthologies of Al Karaki edited in Ahmadnagar in the 1570s. And at least uh, one third was dedicated to Buran Nizam Shah uh, as a gift from Al Karaki. Uh, so there is a definite theological connection. We also know that the Nizam Shahs in this period, in the middle of the uh, six, uh, 16th century, are constantly making dip. In fact, they write a letter saying, we will read the khutbah in your name, in the name of the Safavid ruler. And this was done as a token gesture uh, complemented by very elaborate diplomatic ties and so on, uh, but also as a strategy of countering the Mughals who are slowly going to apply pressure from the north. Towards the end of the 16th century, Shah Abbas I changes the nature of the 12 Shi faith and practice. And so, you know, um, at the end of the 16th century, the Nisam are building too much. Uh, but Malik Ambar will take upon this job of building big congregational mosques. So Shah Abbas starts building and builds uh, and starts using big mosques in his capital, uh, in Isfahan. And immediately the Mughals in North India embark on a program of building very large mosques. Akbar does it at Fatehpur Sikri, then at, uh, later, you know, uh, there is uh, another one, Bil Shah Jan builds one and so on. But uh, the Deccan is really taken by deep ties with uh, Iran all through these coastal ports. And remember, this distance traveling it is easier and shorter than actually things that come across the Narmada and the uh, Vindhyas. So the pattern and typologies of architectural activity and town planning affirm the world of common values and notions of state building which are located in faith across the greater world of the Indian Ocean. And so if you look at the three big Jami mosques in the three Sultanate cities, uh, all of them are attributed to Aurangzeb, or at least expansion is attributed to Aurangzeb. So you look at the Jami mosque in Bijapur, it most probably is built very late in the Bijapur rule, so maybe in the early 1600s, and then finished by Aurangzeb, or at least the claim goes such. The Jami Mosque in Aurangabad, which you see on the top right, again, the claim is that Malik Ambar started it, but it's enlarged by Aurangzeb. And at the bottom, you have the Mecca Mosque in Hyderabad, which is also the Jami there, which again is started by one of the Qutub Shahs in the 16 teens and 20s. And then Aurangzeb decides to finish it, but finish it abruptly. So the minarets, which were supposed to rise much higher, are capped right there and Aurangzeb refuses to sanction more money. But there is a, a you know, very funny kind of uh, political play being uh, really played out in the Deccan Sultanates in the patronization or the lack of patronization of Jami mosques, then in the building of Jami mosques, and then the Mughal takeover of Jami mosques, crediting Aurangzeb with finishing all of them. 
Now, since we are running out of time, we'll look quickly at some of the tombs that get built. And tombs are built in a great variety in the kingdom of Ahmednagar. We didn't look at some important Madhavi mosques in Rohinkhed and Fathkhed, so other areas of the kingdom, but perhaps at some later time we might. Within the city of Ahmednagar, there is the tomb of Sarjay Khan, also known as Doboti Chira. Again, you look at the dome, but the uh, vaults on the side are absolutely flat. You have a tomb called Changiz Khan's tomb. Changiz Khan is very important because he's the person who purchases Malik Ambar. You must have learned a lot about that yesterday. Um, his tomb is octagonal and is double-storied, single-storied on the inside, double on the outside. Again, that arrangement of uh, window over window, which I spoke about, very Nizam Shah, can be seen here. Then you have a tomb which looks unfinished. Maybe it was the tomb of Salabat Khan, popularly called Chan Bibi's Mahal. Mistakenly, there is no physical monument to Chan Bibi in the city. And that is a matter of great concern since she looms larger than life in the history of Ahmednagar. And so one of the grandest looking buildings on a hill, Salabat Khan's tomb, has been commonly attributed to her, but we know it's Salabat Khan's tomb. Again, a place where you can go for a picnic for the whole day, watch the play of wind and light as it goes through the building when the day passes. An important tomb now in the premises of Pitalia Hostel is Rumi Khan's tomb. This is the same Rumi Khan who actually casts the gun called Malike Maidan. Uh, his tomb is two-storied. It was actually used as a residence for a while. Uh, you see things like... Uh, English gables that were added on, uh, now taken off, but an important tomb. And these two-story tombs with a second story that looks large with these kiosks on the corners are all late 16th century or even early 17th century traits. Like this tomb of Hazrat Shah Sharif, the person to whom Maloji Bhonsle asks for a boon, gets two sons and names them after him, Shahji and Sharifji. Again, it's part of a much larger complex, uh, certainly worth a visit. After Murtaza, particularly after Burhan II, there is very little building because there is enormous infighting in, in the kingdom. And then Malik Ambar will try to become the new savior after 1600. And he's not trusted at all by the king. Uh, to whom his daughter eventually will get married as a way of, uh, you know, affirming some kind of trust. In any case, from 1603 to 1607, uh, you know, Ahmadnagar is completely lost to Malik Ambar, who's the regent. Uh, they're trying to flee from place to place. They will eventually also uh, lose Daulatabad. But first they move to Daulatabad, which is their place of refuge. And Malik Ambar rebuilds large parts of the fort. And in fact, the outermost wall of the fort, which you see here, that is named after him. It's called the Umber Court, and by which he brings very large areas of settlement inside of some kind of city wall. There are several buildings here which may be attributed to him. But in any case, this will serve as his capital later on as well. And so the site of Dalatabad has a very rich layer uh, that actually is from the period of Malikambar's regency. Malikambar also will settle in 1610 the city of Kharki that we know as Aurangabad, where he'll build for himself a palace and also a big gate called the Bhadkal Gate. Now, this is not a city gate. This is not a gate to get from inside the city to outside the city. This is more a ceremonial portal like the Charminar, which is not a gate. It is a place through which you pass, uh, but it really marks the center of the city. Malik Ambar also will be credited with building several mosques in the city, including founding the Jami mosques later to be completed by Aurangzeb. He will build a number of mosques called Kali mosques in uh, the city of Aurangabad. Then the capital moves to Paranda, uh, Actually, it will move to uh, Paranda and then to uh, Junnar. At Paranda, there is a mosque, which I'm absolutely sure is built in the reign of Malik Ambar, because the Mughals would never build a mosque like this when they captured Paranda uh, later. This architecture is very remin reminiscent of things you see in Gujarat, particularly the bands on the walls. 
but there are attempts at creating some kind of new style. This period in Paranda is when Malik Ambar finally gets close to power. And this is when he probably builds himself a large mosque. This is not in character of the Nizam Shahi family. And the mosque also has a number of stylistic features which we never see before and never really see after. So these raised bands, which you'll see in Gujarat Sultanate buildings, also in a lot of something that is adopted, you look at the Mira projection with those minarets and it really is very strange. Uh, there is an attempt at archaizing by using those kinds of fluted columns, uh, these forms which have not really been used in the Deccan for a long time. Uh, again, the Jali work is reminiscent of a uh, lot of buildings from Northern Maharashtra and Gujarat. And all the columns are purpose built for this mosque, but yet imitate columns of buildings in this region. These look like temple columns, but they're purpose built for the mosque, you know, because of their placement, because of their uniformity and everything. And there is also an Ayatul Kursi, an inscription of an important verse from the Quran that talks of the throne of God. And so this all seems to be a strategy to consolidate his rule. Then for a brief period, the Nizam Shahi capital under Malik Ambar will move to Junnar, where on private property is this place called Hapus Bagh, which itself etymologically tells you something, probably Hapshi Bagh, and where there is a palace, again, probably dating from Malik Ambar's regency. Of course, it's been built over, there are all kinds of uh, encroachments. It's a magnificent palace, two stories high. I've had it measured and surveyed. Uh, at some point, we'll publish it. And very close to this palace is this tomb called Saudagar Gumbals, which also has uh, an inscriptional program. And the inscription basically is uh, talking about uh, what does it matter if a prince is dead? And Malik Ambar has serious differences with his son-in-law and has him murdered. And I wonder if this has something to do with it. Right next to Saudagar Gumbas is another building, maybe dating from the same period. But the placement of this building with this pyramidal vault, this triangular building close to that tomb, is very similar to a building with a triangular roof that you also find in the enclosure of Ahmad Nizam Shah's uh, tomb. In any case, Malik Ambar, we know, is buried in Kuldabad, but he seems to have died at another place that bears his name, a place called Amrapur, where there is a small mosque. And inside the mosque, there is the grave of Malik Ambar, which when you talk to the people, you realize is not a grave, but only a cenotaph with a pit inside, very similar to the kind of pit at Bingar, where Aurangzeb died. And so Malik Ambar very likely died here, and then his body was taken away to Kuldabad to be buried in this mausoleum that he had designed for himself. Absolutely stunning with all kinds of jallies, many of them vandalized now. And all in around the vicinity of this tomb are superb tombs from this period, many unknown. And um, um, again, the whole purpose is to be close to the major saints who are buried there. This is a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sacred ground and everybody's desire was to be buried right here. But I think I'll stop now because it is eight o'clock. How do I turn my video on? And how do I get to questions? And so uh, there are quite a number of them in the chat. So yeah. let me go right to the top. Okay. So uh, doesn't the Jami Masjid of Kirki, the big Jami Masjid, and that Masjid is the, the enlargement and that is attributed to Aurangzeb. So we don't know how much is built by Malik Ambar, whether he actually built it, whether Aurangzeb built it and said, I've only enlarged it, but both are associated with it. Uh, okay, there's an exhibition at the Asiatic Society at the Garbar Hall. So um, please do take a look at it. Uh, there are people who've also enjoyed uh, the exhibition. And there's a request to put questions. Uh, 
Yeah, I have no clue about, uh, I mean, again, that building now, uh, uh, it's very difficult to access the kinds of details. Maybe 10, 15 years ago, it was much easier. But uh, it needs to be looked at very carefully, along with uh, other mosques as well. The tall water tank interests, what are the lifting aerators? No, the, the lifts are really uh, operated by draft animals, which are made to go up and down a ramp. A lot of evidence of something like the Persian wheel. Uh, mostly it is uh, uh, you know, draft animal drawn water. But you raise water enough that from there you can gravity feed it everywhere. Uh, so did the Nizam Shah's inheritance continue Turkish? Uh, see, the label Turkish is very problem because it's a modern label. Uh, there is, I mean, uh, the, there are Turkic peoples who come to India like the Adil Shahs and the uh, Qutub Shahs, but they are heavily Persianized. I mean, how, how, how much uh, of affinity do they have to their Turkicness in terms of culture becomes a question. Uh, I agree. With the Ottomans, we do not know of a lot of uh, exchange or interaction, except at the Battle of Chaul, uh, where the Ottoman fleet is also involved. I think it is the people at Diu who are really masterminding this. Yes, I did not mention the Hathi Baudi, uh, uh, but again, we can't mention everything. Sorry about that. The Nizam Shahs don't use marble or blue tiles. This is not the region of marble. And uh, India has been terrible in uh, producing uh, glaze tiles. In fact, the efforts that you see in the Chini Mahal at Dawlatabad or uh, even uh, at Ashtur, uh, and then uh, also in the Sultanate of Bengal at, uh, at the Qutub Shahi tombs in Golconda, the tiles that are made here don't seem to last very long. I don't know if it's the tiles to blame or are ravaging monsoons. Okay. Are there marked ar architectural differences between royal tombs and Sufis? Uh, no. Uh, there are certain motifs that seem to appear on tombs of people associated with the royal family or with the court. So one of them are lamps hanging on chains and so on. But you'll see it across sultanates. There are also certain kinds of splayed feet at the uh, corner pilasters that you see associated with royal families. But remember, the Sufi and the Sheikh, uh, as an article by uh, Simon Digby, uh, written several decades ago, talk, the, the you know, uh, Sufi and the Sultan, always uh, the Sultan and the Sheikh, sorry, uh, they thought of themselves as rulers, both of them, one within a, a you know, worldly realm and one within a spiritual realm. And so the vocabulary for both of them is absolutely shared. Both of them sit in darbars. Uh, both of them are called Shah. Uh, in fact, you can you, you know look at half a dozen words and lexicons used in a Sufi court and the royal court, and they're absolutely the same. Um, but the blueprint is very simple. I mean, what your technology affords you is either a square or an octagonal building. And what you need to do is have the very clever way of transitioning from a square or an octagon to a domed ceiling. And the dome has assumed a certain kind of metaphysical uh, importance uh, after the 12th, 13th century. And it's almost universally used on any tomb. So you might find mosques with flat roofs, but you'll almost never find a tomb with a flat roof. You'll have uh, uh, the Saudagar Gumbas. I don't even know how the name comes about. Uh, again, no clue. Uh, and of course, I, I do know Faiza Jazdanwala, I've read her works and various things. So uh, the gra granddaughter of the Nawab of Janjira, uh, Ken has reminded us that she's uh, in the audience, reminded me. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have her here. Uh, again, pyramidal domes, no connection with uh, Egypt because these are not solid pyramids. Can we join you when you go to Ahmednagar? Uh, sure. Uh, I don't know when. The honeycomb in the mosques is uh, something called mukarnas. And it's a very peculiar feature of Islamic architecture. Uh, what it means uh, has been speculated about. It seems to arise 
sometime in the 10th, 11th century. And it really is a masterpiece of mathematical and geometrical virtuosity because these are uh, interlocking blocks glazed like tiles uh, that create this stalactite structure. And uh, let me see if I have a good image of it so that people get a sense of what we are talking of. Uh, I'm just opening up an image and sharing it. We don't see so much of it in India. This. Uh, this is not a tradition we actually... So there are attempts at doing things like this, at Sikandara, in some of the palaces, like the palace at Amir, but it's not quite done the uh, same okay, way that it's screen. done in Iran. I mean, this... Yeah, okay now. Sorry, can you can you see it now? Yes, yes it's visible. And so, uh, no, it's not a technical requirement. It's actually, you know, mathematical and construction virtuosity. And it really doesn't come to the technique either. What we do is what we know best to do with stone, which is to have very heavy brackets and this. This happens to it, but later on it will have all kinds of esoteric meanings attached to the eight paradises and so on. Uh, Anna asks, how much did influence the Nizam? It happens. Okay. So, uh, We, we had a question from uh, S.K. Aruni, but I've lost all the questions too. Uh, sir, I'll post it again. Uh, there is a question by Ankit. Can yeah. you shed more can light on the... the eight spaces and eight gardens? So, so, yeah, yeah. so uh, that there is, I mean, there is a structural reason. So if you write to me, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, the underground tunnels used in that era, there are no tunnels. What you have are actually water uh, conduits and uh, aqueducts. Sometimes they are large enough to be mistaken for tunnels, but they are not tunnels. Uh, uh, but a, a tunnel is something that catches our imagination. So I love this idea uh, uh, that people scurry between buildings in these dark tunnels filled with snakes and poisonous gases. Uh, very unlikely. But there is some study on the uh, waterworks. Uh, there are two books. One is uh, edited by Vijay Paranjpe, Badam and Chakrabarti, I think, called um, published by Aryan Books on traditional water systems. And then, of course, there, there is M.S. Mate's book on hydraulic uh, structures in medieval right. India, I think. Uh, how much influence did the Nizam Shahi art traditions have on subsequent Marat? Uh, till about 1700, very heavily. Uh, then, for a period of 20 years, there is a Maratha civil war. Everybody is fighting everybody, and Maratha is fighting each other. Uh, Maratha is fighting the Mughals. Maratha is fighting whoever they can. After 1720, when there is a certain kind of stability that the Marathas have, uh, they start following a Mughal idiom because that's, that kind of architecture now represents power. The day of the Sultanate is clearly gone. So that's not your aspiration. Yeah, one of the things I would add is that I'm, we're trying to figure out what miniature paintings came from the various states like Kolhapur and Sitara and so on and so forth. And uh, really, there's very little ex that, you know, has been written about this except about Sitara. And there's a set of Ragamala paintings that was in the Mirage Jr. collection. But there must be a lot more. And when I did Gujarat, I found uh, schools of painting in Jamnagar and uh, Junagar and Radhanpur and Bhavnagar and so on and so forth. Uh, so that uh, we expect to find the same thing in places like Boer and so on. And of course, Aound has a 20th century art tradition uh, of a different sort. 
So are artificial lakes surrounding palaces found in buildings built by Mughals? Uh, rare. The Mughals actually never deal with uh, hydraulics on the scale that the Deccan Sultanates do. Uh, the Sultanate of Malwa and then the kingdoms in Gujarat and the Deccan are really masters at uh, uh, you know, uh, really moving very large volumes of water uh, for frolic and pleasure and of course for utility. The Mughals are a lot more conservative in their uh, water management where they'll site cities on river banks. They will rely on, uh, you know, wells. Um, uh, they will have channels that flow through their gardens, but never very large pools unless they're natural. Are there YouTube questions or is everybody contained within this uh, room? So there's one more question from YouTube, which I posted in the chat. Ah, great. Yes, and I'm sure they did, but uh, what are you going to do? Uh, so the question is, did Shia religious elite or congregations have issues about a powerful Sunni emperor, Aurangzeb, taking on extensions or modifications uh, to major mosques? And I'm sure there were people who were disgruntled, but these uh, sectarian divides were also flexible. You have lots of people who seem to switch back and forth. So Ahmadnagar is also unusual in the sense that once it shifts to Shia Islam, it never changes back the dynasty. Whereas if you look at something like Bijapur, for example, uh, almost every 10 years, they're switching back and forth. Uh, acoustic techniques used, uh, I don't know how deliberate they are, but all domes naturally have acoustic properties, uh, which I'm sure people know how to exploit. But even then, they're not really building large congregational mosques. So, uh, like a bishop. Yeah, but I, I think uh, uh, the kind of uh, acoustic aesthetics of you know uh, sprinkling water, uh, uh, burbling water, all that probably is used. Most of these water management technologies are uh, imported. And we do know of uh, people who do come over to build karezes and kanats and so on. And Sita Kund, unfortunately, I don't know uh, which Sita Kund. Uh, there's probably a, a Sita Kund in every district. Uh, so, Mandav Fort or Mandu is uh, built, uh, I mean, what we see now is mostly built by the Sultans of Malwa. And uh, I mean, that site is really spectacular. It's one off, it needs a deep study. Uh, and uh, Raigad actually has been reasonably well studied, but uh, again, we need more uh, archeology. span This whole business of uh, clapping at the bottom so that you hear claps on top as they tell you in Golconda, uh, a lot of it is, uh, actually made up. I mean, this is folklore. Like I said, conspiracy theories, uh, these kinds of fantastic tales are a lot more attractive than the drab or dreary existence of uh, an early modern age. So we are captivated by these stories of escaping through tunnels or clapping at the bottoms of hills so that people can hear about it on top. Uh, now, uh, Diya Chaudhary says, Salabat Khan's tomb has become a mecca of tea shops and restaurants, leading to plastic problems and other issues. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I mean, the ASI can only do so much. They're all short staffed. Uh, people have to take it upon themselves. And it's not just Salabat Khan's tomb. I mean, every major fort in Maharashtra today is plagued with problems of plastic waste. Perhaps we should end it at this point because we've run over. Uh, but one, thank you. There's one question which has come up. Uh, just the, uh, does Malik Ambar has a role in building Janjira? Ah. Not, not so much in building because the building that you see now is mostly from the 1720s and 30s under Surur Khan, uh, Siddhi Surur Khan. Uh, Malik Ambar appoints some of the early uh, commanders of Janjira. Uh, he's... Uh, very much involved in uh, putting people in charge over there. And uh, the, the story of uh, Janjir is told in the two books that I've done, African elites in India and uh, African rulers and generals. Yep. 
So there is one request from one participant. If you could show the first slide of the tome, uh, since there is some minute. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. First slide of the tomb of the uh, just says the first slide. I don't know okay. what uh, it says the tomb. Well, it is by Sun, Mr. Sanjay. Okay, let us do so. This was the first tomb I showed. Yeah, open. So mm. This building on the outside has a small niche where you can place your two fingers and therefore it's called Do Boti Chira. Uh, but it's actually the tomb of Sarjay Khan and it's part of again a larger Rauza complex which means there is a tomb and beyond the tomb there is a funerary mosque. So the tomb and the mosque are an ensemble. They probably would have been set in a garden when they were built. Now, there's also something very interesting about uh, a lot of these tombs. You wonder why people build tombs for themselves in their lifetimes and why they are so different. A lot of times you build basically a garden pavilion. And upon your death, it's converted to a waqf, which is a pious foundation or a religious foundation, a religious trust. And once you do that, it's impossible for the king to take back the land. And so in many cases, you build yourself essentially a pavilion, but you get buried in it and have a work set up so that the lands are controlled by your descendants forever. A lot of these lands are given as political favor and they can be taken back. And you prevent that uh, by using these kinds of strategies. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh everybody at the Mumbai Research Center and uh, Ramesh Raghavan uh, for arranging this. Appreciate it very much. And we hope to see you all again. And we want to thank you for your participation. And Bushkar, I'll be speaking to you soon. Okay. Bye. So uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Robbins. Uh, really appreciate your efforts in making this happen along with uh, Ramesh. And um, also thank you, uh, Dr. Pushkar. I know you're busy with the conference and in spite of that, uh, taking time off. And uh, thank you participants, everybody who's joined on Zoom uh, to the team of MRC uh, and till our next series. And there is a map exhibition going on, sorry, the textile exhibition going on at the Asiatic Darbar Hall. Tomorrow is the last day of it. So if anybody is still interested, uh, we hope to see you all. And uh, once again, thank you everyone and um, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.